Okay, so a warm welcome again to everybody who's joining us, uh, whether in reality or virtually. Um, and uh, you know, it's quite uh, lovely to uh, have this uh, opportunity to acknowledge uh, 25 years of Abhayagiri, honoring our elders, honoring our teachers. It's a, uh, <clears throat> um, it's taken a, a, a fair bit of um, organization for uh, Janyaniko. He was the conceived of the idea to, to do it. Of course, that's one of the problems of having ideas, is you actually have to follow through on them. <laughs> and, uh, and it's great. Um, that's the, uh, it's wonderful when <coughs> there, are, uh, there is that, uh, uh, you know, picking up on something. And, and, uh, and, but of course it was uh, many other people helping, particularly Kathy is, uh, has been uh, the uh, sort of the Zoom maestro and uh, helping us, but then there's also a variety of monks been uh, helping to uh, figure out how to make our uh, live streaming, Zoom, YouTube actually function. Um, and uh, it seems to have come together quite, uh, quite wonderfully. <coughs> uh, so that's... Uh, <coughs> there's an added, um, let's say, uh, uh, added element of surprise when, it, when one has technology involved as well. So, it, uh, so that, uh, that's been a... Uh, a challenge and and people have risen to the challenge <clears throat> so it's and and it's interesting is that uh, it seems to have been fairly easy to complicate things and it's more difficult to simplify it uh, which is a great metaphor metaphor for life uh, it's what uh, it's what we all do as human beings and uh, and that, uh, <clears throat> and one has to make a, a conscious effort to, to, uh, to simplify. Uh, so, but anyway, it has resulted in us having this gathering and uh, to, to be able to reflect on uh, you know, 25 years of, of a Giri. And uh, that sense of, of you know, giving a certain acknowledgement and um, appreciation, honor, respect to all the people who have uh, brought it to this point, which is it's a huge number of people, really. <coughs> and, uh, say, Abhayagiri started as an idea um, so it's 25 years of Abhayagiri. The idea started quite a, quite a few years before that of a group of, of uh, Bay Area people who uh, had met uh, Ajahn Sumedho, uh, who had um, realized that there were uh, monasteries in the Thai, tr Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Chah in particular. <coughs> Several of those people also went out to <coughs> Thailand to to uh, you know, see the the roots uh, of uh, uh, of the tradition. Uh, many people went uh, 
to England uh, when there was nothing before there was anything here. And then, of course, uh, Lo Posamedo used to come to America every year uh, because his, when his parents were still alive, then uh, he, would, he would come back and then he would meet people uh, and, and many people got inspired and wanted to and wanted to have a, a, a monastery. So that's... Uh, it wasn't uh, you know, the actual physical monastery <coughs> didn't really begin till, till uh, 1996, June the 1st, 1996. And uh, of all of those, let's say, the people who came on June the 1st, 1996, to open the monastery, did Debbie come that day? She wasn't, she wasn't here that day. Okay. So, so you were the only person who, who is here now, right? <clears throat> yeah. So, the night before, June the 1st, May 31st, was, there was actually Visakha Puja. And uh, Ajahn Amaro, uh, they did, held a Visakha Puja at um, 10 Arbor Street, which was a house of Mark Lieberman. Uh, and he, his front room was like a shrine room. Uh, and was, uh, that was the meditation hall for Sangapala Foundation. And meetings took place there regularly and uh, kind of energy started to slowly gather <coughs> uh, in, uh, 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 um, from, from that point. And uh, of course Ajahn Amaro went back and forth for quite a few years. Uh, Ajahn Sumedho delegated Ajahn Amaro to be the, the, uh, you know, the point person or the person to to take responsibility for if when if and when anything happened. So uh, <coughs> he uh, uh, he'd come and spend six weeks, three months um, uh, each year for quite a few years. And uh, and finally, the Sangapala Foundation actually made a kind of a request to the Sangha in England because the Sangha in England was quite hesitant to um, commit to establishing anything in America. And they had their hands full in. England, and they had a couple branch monasteries in, well, one in Italy, one in Switzerland, also New Zealand, uh, that they were taking responsibility for, and it was like, you know, oh, oh, we've got enough, <clears throat> and uh, we don't want to spread ourselves too thin. So there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, hesitancy and reserve to... Uh, to establish anything new in America, knowing that that it would take uh, take energy, uh, actual human beings uh, uh, should have people who are trained to come here, and uh, so that they were uh, they were very slow to commit to to start anything. So then they. They, um, um, with that kind of happening, then, then the Sangapala Foundation, um, they had, um, it was quite a lot of effort to like bring into being, rent a place for a short period of time, make it all happen, and then dismantle it again, only to try to, bring it all together again the next year. So they actually made a request to the, to the uh, 
Sangha in England, 1995, it was, <coughs> the year before it was established. And, uh, <coughs> and it was at that meeting when, um, you can sort of see the, the, how the devas or the forces of goodness are working behind the scenes somehow, because they, uh, it was that meeting, they gave permission to, the Sangha in England gave permission for Sangha politics go ahead to uh, try to find something that they could commit to putting energy and resources into that would be more permanent uh, without having uh, the Sangha to commit to sending anybody. And then it was shortly after that meeting, I mean, like within 24 hours, that the Sangha had given permission, and then Ajahn Sumedho received the offering from Master Hua for the uh, 125 acres here in Redwood Valley to uh, establish a, a monastery. So it was uh, <coughs> very fortuitous, because Ajahn Sumedho wasn't at the meeting. He was here in America visiting his family. And uh, so he was called down to L.A. where Master Hua was. He was on his deathbed, very ill. And, uh, and Master Hua formally made the offering of uh, uh, 125 acres of, of, of forest land in Mendocino County, which is, is here. So there's two pieces of property uh, where, the, that where we are right now was a piece of property that after this was the, it's, it's, it's on this side, if we're looking up the hill, uh, and that what was Master Hua offered was sort of on this side. And then this, so it's very long and narrow. Both properties start at Tomkai and go up to the top of the ridge. And uh, so this, and they're both about 125 acres. Um, so then after the <coughs> property was offered, then Sangapala Foundation started thinking, well, you know, if we're going to invite monks, we should sort of see, I think it was the possibility of 1996, the next year, being an opportunity to invite uh, the monks to to come, and I think I might have already committed to coming by then. Was kind of the impetus as well for looking for for land to that where because what they needed was the the land that Master Hua offered. There was no electricity, no water, no buildings. And they thought, well, if we rented a place nearby, then we could see if that land is developable. I think you made the offer to Ajahn Amaro sometime in the summer of 95, or the fall, but it didn't become public until... It, I actually made the... Yeah, I mean, I, I made the offer to Ajahn Amaro in something like April of 95. Of 95. I was doing a year-long retreat in Chithurst Forest. And uh, I knew that this was happening. And uh, oh, I knew that this wasn't happening because there was, Ajahn Amaro was designated, but it wasn't going forward. So I thought, well, maybe if I offer to help Ajahn Amaro, that'd be a support for him because I've known him. Um, since he wandered in off the beaches from the south of Thailand <laughs> to Wat Nanachat. <laughs> and and uh, 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 so I mean, I've known him since he showed up at Wat Nanachat and became a Anagarika, a novice, a monk, and then 
known him over the years and we always got along, so I figured it might be a good mix. But because I was in retreat at <coughs> uh, in, in England and I wasn't going to be going back to Thailand till the fall, uh, then um, I uh, said, you know, you'll just have to wait uh, until I get permission from uh, the Sangha, Wat Bapong Sangha, Wat Nanachat, and see if it's it's okay for me to actually do it. Uh, my own, my heart was in it, but I also had to think in terms of other people. So that was uh, so. Ajahn Amaro was was uh, say privy to information that other people didn't know about. So sometimes I think it was, uh, he got criticized for being overly optimistic about doing anything here. Uh, and, and, uh, and, he, and he remember him saying, he said, I just, sometimes I just could hardly keep my mouth shut. You know? He said, but I've got this ace in the hole. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so that, uh, yeah, that, came to be, and then, then um, so Sangapala went ahead and started looking for a rental property that they could have the monks come to, and then I think that was like in the winter of, the winter of like late 95, early 96, because I'd already, already, uh, I had already gone sort of public. Uh, that I was I was involved, and then because uh, I remember discussing with him in Thailand, um, and that this was a was a possible was like early '96, and negotiations were going on. But then what happened is they they found that this property right here was was being rented by somebody. So then they contacted the owner to see if it was possible to rent it they were and uh, and then the owner sort of said well i'm actually just he was renting it but then he said well i'm actually just drawing up the paperwork now to sell so you can either buy it or forget it and so they scrambled and and uh, were able to to arrange for purchase of course they didn't have any money but Sangapala Foundation was rolling in dough in those days, ready to make real estate commit. They had fifteen thousand dollars in the bank. <laughs> so, that's, which, uh, even in those days, it wasn't much money. <laughs> the, they, but you know, everything. There was lots of. Goodwill and lots of lots of people helping from all sorts of so that just that sense of you know, okay they reflecting on uh, you know, sort of the beginnings of a biagiri and the continuity of a biagiri it relies on so many people uh, and the uh, both say within the sangha and within the greater community. Um, Helping out and uh, um, um, yeah, giving uh, support uh, in in so many different ways, and uh, <clears throat> then they and they did arrange for the purchase and, and the date of the moving in was June the first. And yeah, so May 31st, they were still in the, and they spent what, a month or so in the, month or so in the city with the lay community and then getting ready to, to move up. And then they were able to 
and it just happened to be the night before was was Visakha Puja, so the various uh, lay people who were associated with with uh, Sangapala um, met together at uh, Dr. Mark Lieberman's house in his shrine, big shrine room, and uh, and then Ajahn Amaral gave. Ajahn Kurundamo, the Anagarika precepts, and put him into white and began his <coughs> monastic career. And so Ajahn Kurundamo has been here since day one. And I showed up six months later. I mean, I, was, I had made a commitment to help, but then when I got back to Thailand, and started passing on my duties and and uh, organizing things to to leave. I mean, I'd spent 23 years in Thailand, so I'd put down far deeper roots than than uh, than, than I realized, and it took me much longer to to uh, uh, to disentangle myself and do things in a beautiful way. Uh, in order to to uh, to leave uh, smoothly and and uh, uh, leave uh, Wat Dana Chat in uh, left in the good hands of uh, Jinjaya Saro and uh, and then with the blessings of the of the uh, of the senior elders in in Thailand. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a, an auspicious beginning, um, both, say, starting here, uh, and then uh, for myself when I came. I arrived in San Francisco New Year's Eve, uh, beginning 1997, and started the new year to uh, be helping out here to, at... Uh, at a Baigiri. and so when I got here, there was they had just finished building a kuti to receive me. That was the lower Black Rock kuti, which those kutis were. There was five kutis built that first year, and they were kind of thrown up pretty quickly with uh, scavenge materials and odds and ends, uh, thinking that they would last for a few years, and uh, then they could be replaced. Of course, it's only just this past year that, that uh, um, the first one has been finally replaced, the log cabin, um, and it was I mean, it was. It was. It was. Sort of, those were all logs that were found by a neighbor up the road, uh, and they were kind of discarded by the loggers because they were a bit too small. Uh, so then uh, um, we scavenged them, uh, peeled them, and put them, got them stacked up, and put it made into the walls. Of course, by well, actually, for the last. Many years. So, if it were a day like today, with with you know the wind is blowing pretty pretty. There's quite a wind today. If you're sitting inside the uh, inside the log cabin, yeah, you'd be having the wind blowing <laughs> blowing through you. So that was uh, um, it was uh, it was ready to be replaced. And and the other ones are lower Black Rock and upper Black Rock. Those are actually in quite good shape. Um, we've, uh, they were fixed up a few years after. Well, we actually had to fix them up. Um, the county required us to uh, bring them up to some kind of a code and uh, <laughs> make, them, make them more <clears throat> acceptable to the, to the building department and so that they're still in good shape. And those will probably be the, the last two to come down. And the other two, the 8x8 eight eight and the 10x10, 10 10, those are 
and hopefully those will, in the next year or two or three, those will get replaced and they're ready. But those early years, um, yeah, I was just thinking of, uh, I said, you, um, you, you guys moved in here, because there's a little house, uh, old garage that, you know, there's nothing very nice here. And I didn't even, was it Richard Smith who drove out from Michigan with a washing machine? Yes, he did. Yeah, and we didn't have a washing machine. And he drove out to wash me. I don't know if he had a fridge. He brought the dryer. He brought the dryer. I bought the washing machine. You bought the. <laughs> <laughs> The Jen Crudeau still had had money as a as an anagaric, but the washing machine and Richard Smith came out with the offered the dryer and so brought it out. I think he brought some other appliance too. I have his memory. Paul Friedlander, with the fridge. Yep. Paul Friedlander offered the fridge. I was thinking we were just recently heard about something. Yeah, Paul Friedlander was one of the early people. He's been he helped. Uh, um, he's been helping with Thanksgiving retreat like forever. So before Abhayagiri. Yeah. So which is another sort of, yeah, this arc of people involved um, with the that sense of wanting to see Abhayagiri be a, uh, yeah, a place of refuge. Because that's what, what uh, say, Abhayagiri, literally it means, f uh, Abhaya means fearless. Right? Um, Giri is mountain, so fearless mountain. But fearless in the sense of secure, safe, a place of safety, a place of security, uh, a place where one does not have to dwell in fear, which is how, if you are a sentient being um, with any kind of a nervous system, um, you experience fear, and uh, certainly as human beings um, and in the animal realm, uh, kind of the one of the predominant emotions is fear, and it drives a lot of our conduct and our our and our relationships, so that to be able to um, try to create a place uh, there where people could come and they could put their fears down. Uh, and say uh, that, that that's a, a gift uh, uh, to, yeah, to the society, to the culture. Um, and it's a, uh, you know, America, I mean, any culture, any cluster of human beings together. Uh, yeah, fear is a major component of, 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 of life. But, uh, you know, America in particular is, is uh, um, definitely driven by fear. Um, that's a... Uh, um, I mean, there's many reasons for that, many elements to it. Um, certainly the degree of competition that is part and parcel of the, the uh, um, uh, consumer culture. Um, uh, it, it, it drives, it's a fear-driven um, uh, culture. And of course it's, uh, it's, for a long time, it's had a, you know, an under undercurrent of of uh, and kind of yeah, violence uh, that uh, you know the opposite and, and or component of that is fear. Uh, so they're trying to provide a place of of refuge, and and that uh, um, was one of the. The purposes of of uh, of having, as a a as a 
as a as an as a namesake. Uh, there's also Ajahn Amaro is is uh, he's a a bit of a a history buff and. Uh, uh, history buff, polyglot, and poly, polymath, and and um, uh, that sense of of uh, uh, knowing that in say Buddhist history uh, in Sri Lanka, oh, about a thousand years ago or so, there was a a uh, uh, a famous monastery in Sri Lanka that called a Bayagiri and it was very large, thousands of, of monks, um, probably thousands of nuns as well and uh, that was, uh, uh, it was, a, it was a, a monastery that straddled different lineages and traditions. Uh, it, uh, uh, and was a, a practice tradition, um, uh, very much a practice tradition. It's like for most mm, traditional Buddhists that have heard of the uh, Visuddhi Magga, which is a, uh, uh, a commentarial manual on uh, teachings and practice, um, but it is, has, a, has a very strong element of the... Uh, um, uh, it's out of a, a, like a, a, a monastery that was the Mahavihara in, in Sri Lanka, and it is a, is a bit more of a... and it still exists, I think. Um, the... Uh, uh, um, the scholarly tradition and uh, but the uh, uh, there's a, another book that was a, a manual of practice Vimutti Magga and it came out of a Bhagiri and it was a um, say much more of a a practice mo uh, manual a meditation manual uh, I mean, it was grounded in the in the uh, uh, in the in the teachings, but it had a bit more of a flavor of meditation and practice, mental training, uh, than the theoretical aspects of of the scholasticism. Um, so that, but that was a Baikiri, had that lineage, um, but also what what happened was there had been this back and forth, back and forth, over many centuries. And finally the king at that particular time in Sri Lanka um, decided that the Mahavihara, the, the other monastery, um, should, have, should have primacy, should be the prime. Um, and Abhayagiri should not, so it was actually disbanded. Um, the remnants are still there today. There's a huge, huge uh, stupa that still exists today. I went a few years ago and paid respects at the Abhayagiri stupa. It's, it's a uh, uh, quite quite moving to see. <coughs> but anyway, that sense of of having a place of practice, having a place of refuge. Um, and and again, that's where these it, it encompassed the different lineages. And because Master Hua made the offering, he's a Chinese Mahayana monk. It was a way of of uh, honoring him as well. Um, so that we've had um, you know, a very warm, close relationship with the with the. Uh, City of ten thousand Buddhas uh, since the since before Abhayagiri. Um, the because uh, <coughs> Master Hua passed away in in 
1995. He, he passed away shortly after the offering of the land was made. And then, was it the last trip that Lumpur was here that um, anyway, one one of the one of the last trips that Lumpasameda was here, and he was um, because uh, um, he's always uh, he's he he is always invited to go give a talk at uh, at City of Ten Thousand Buddhas, and he always goes. He's extremely has a very warm feeling towards towards our community, and. Uh, Anyway, he went to to give the talk, a formal Dhamma talk to the whole assembly, which is a big community, and is in the Buddha Hall, and they invited Lumpa Sumedho to sit in Master Hua's Dhamma seat. Nobody had sat in that seat since he passed away, and they invited Lumpa Sumedho to give the, uh, address the assembly from from Master Hua's Dhamma seat. So it was a very uh, um, touching gesture and, and that sense, again, the sense of feeling of mutual respect and mutual appreciation and gratitude for, for each other. And I think that's one of the things in terms of, um, say, as a monastery, 25 years of Abhayagiri, um, it's not about, and should never be about, you know, how do we, how do we compete with these other people? How do we, how do we angle for advantage? You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's, that's so, uh, 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 just so wrong. Um, and, but it's more like how, how can we be a part of this, um, this human life, and try to bring um, a, a, play, a place of refuge, a place of safety, a place of, of uh, harmony and community um, into, into the world. And so that, uh, um, that's an ongoing project. And this 25 years of Abhayagiri, hopefully that can, continues for another 25 years anyway, uh, that uh, the, it's like, it's like in another f three, four years, it'll be the 50th anniversary of Wat Banana Chat, the international monastery, uh, that uh, Ajahn Cha established, uh, and Lumpa Sumedho was the first Abbot, <clears throat> I was there on the first year. Um, there's a group. I think there's eleven of us all together. I think nine, nine monks, one novice, and one anagarka. Um, and uh, um, it's amazing to to think, but it's you know, all of a sudden you know time time passes, and uh, yeah, like twenty five years so it seems like a long time, uh, but uh, you know it's it's uh, um, it's it's within many of our memories, uh, and there'll be many of the. Uh, uh, the uh, community that that uh, you know are here uh, have been here since the beginning, but then who have also uh, even been here before uh, the establishing of of a Bayagiri and helped to sort of facilitate that to make it uh, make it work. Yeah. So that uh, um, yeah, time time continues. Time it doesn't. Uh, um, it, it doesn't actually slow down and stop for anybody, and uh, there there will be uh, um, 
people who will be. I remember um, I was, when we were building this building, Lumpali, um, the abbot of Wat Pa um, he was looking at the construction of it, and 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 he's very he's very observant, and he himself is a is a builder, <coughs> and uh, he's looking at it, and he said, and then he is sort of uh, after looking and watching the builders working away, and he said, hmm. at least a hundred and fifty or two hundred years. <laughs> so it was. Uh, he was. Uh, he said, "Okay, this is this is going to be here for a while." Uh, so, but I think it's you know, in terms of the the uh, establishing, uh, uh, say, a baigiri, um, and yeah, honoring our elders, honoring our teachers. Um, Lupo Samedo was very, um, um, he was a catalyst for this uh, to, to happen. Um, and that, uh, and I remember one time <coughs> being with um, Lupo Samedo and, and Lupo Cha, we were at a branch monastery in Ubon, in, in Thailand. And um, it was the first time that Ajahn Sumedho had come back from England to visit Thailand. And, and uh, Ajahn, Sumedho, uh, Ajahn Cha made the comment, well, you, know, you should really appreciate all that say, Ajahn Sumedho has done. He's been the he's, 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 he's been the tank who has gone before all of you. <laughs> sort of prepared the way for, for all the rest of you. So, so it's similar. This, uh, Abhayagiri is very much uh, I mean he went to England and established a Sangha, first Sangha in the West um, and <clears throat> put down those roots and, and uh, made that uh, uh, something that was accepted and viable uh, and replicable uh, that, say, inspired uh, lay people in the San Francisco Bay Area to want to have a place like that here in the Bay Area. Or, and uh, so that, and it happens, so it's Again, sort of the the uh, uh, Samedo, uh, being the kind of like the the tank out in front of the uh, everybody else, or the tractor that pushes the way, bulldozer that, that clears the way, and uh, I think he's actually the se most senior American victim in the world. I'll, yeah, I'll bet he is. Lost that. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yes, so he's. Uh, is the most yeah most senior American bhikkhu in the world, and uh, gosh, these days he is um, he's on fire with his teaching. No, he's, he's teaching just about every week, and because uh, he moved back to um, he was away in Thailand uh, for about ten years and moved back to Amravati. Early this year, I think in January, I guess, and then, you know, getting acclimated, well, going through his quarantine and then getting acclimated and, and then slowly starting to um, teach. And now he's, he's teaching on a quadra at least once a week these days, if not twice. Uh, and... Uh, um, you know, it's quite wonderful to see, because on a certain level, you know, he's falling apart. He, <laughs> he's, he'll be 
uh, he will be 87. Um, yeah, he'll be 87 um, this summer. Um, he's, uh, we're 15 years apart. And my birthday is the 26th of July, he's the 27th. So then, so he'll be, he'll be 87, you know, he's, he's got an 87 year old body. <laughs> uh, hearing's not so good, eyes are not good at all, his balance is not very good, um, but his heart is bright, brilliant. Uh, and his ability to articulate and point uh, to the, and the, the essence of the... He's, he's not talking a whole lot about, uh, how do you say, the details. He's talking about kind of the essence of things, and it's, it's very beautiful. And because he spent a whole lifetime laying the foundations of all the, the uh, kind of the, the nuts and bolts and then the, the, the details and, and it's, it's uh, keeps just coming back to the, to the essence of it and, and just the, you know, the reality of, of uh, you know, as our doorway into uh, liberation is through the, the ability of the heart to just know and see clearly. That is, um, and of course it, you can talk about it, explain it, splice and dice it all these different ways, and, but the essence of it is just this quality of ability to know and see clearly. And to, yeah, to not get lost, not get entangled, not, not complicate things too much. Which is a tall order because we're, we're, we're so uh, adept at complicating. Um, uh, but, uh, and, um, you know, as a uh, living in a <clears throat> In a monastery like this, um, say a Baigiri, again, it's I say a gift of of security, safety, fearlessness. Um, but in order to experience that, in order to um, embody that, one has to return to the knowing. One has to return to awareness. Um, as soon as we start moving out and proliferating, then we start tripping ourselves up. And this is something that, that uh, you know, certainly in terms of, say, honoring our elders, honoring our teachers, um, Ajahn Chah is the inspiration for all of us. Um, it might for it might be a bit more difficult for uh, people who are um, younger or more newly uh, connected uh, with our tradition. Uh, but yeah, Ajahn Chah is the the uh, the inspiration for Ajahn Sumedho to to train, to live the holy life, to um, practice and, and to uh, gain understanding of, of the, this path. Um, and, and that, uh, so having, uh, as for myself, um, that was my inspiration to commit to, uh, to 
Buddhist practice and, and particularly monastic training, um, that w it was was uh, was Ajahn Chah. Um, there's something about um, him that um, you know, inspired not just inspired me, but inspired so many people, um, both Thai and Western, and uh, and they. Uh, you know, he was um, he was a w wonderful communicator. Uh, his ability to communicate and inspire uh, and encourage uh, uh, people to to practice and live live the Dhamma, and, and uh, you know, and oftentimes people would be amazed or confused as to how can you know how can how can, uh, saying to him, you know, how can you teach um, th these people, especially these Westerners who come from all around the world, or, or foreigners, um, because came from many, many different countries, uh, and and you know, he said, "Well, you know, it's, it's, it's just like." Uh, and the, and the image, of course, is is quite f funny in Thai, and this especially so because he gives the image of teaching buffaloes, which buffaloes are the epitome of dullness in 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 Thai culture. Sort of that, and so, so comparing was, yeah, you know, it's just like teaching buffalo. He's teaching these Westerners, they, yeah, you can. No, if, if if buffaloes can learn, I'm surely these frogs can learn. <laughs> so it's you know because you know you don't you don't have a common language with a buffalo. You can train it to do this, train it to do that. You can uh, have it uh, be of help and service, and that's it. Yeah, so. So Ajahn Chah said he was he was a master at bringing things down to to a very simple, relatable terms, and and uh, uh, yeah, and again a sense of not overly complicating things. He was was uh, was able to really uh, you know, say, well, what is the essence? Not in an intellectual way, but in a a direct knowing way. And of course, the the essence is is what the Buddha himself said over and over and over and over again all through his forty five years of teaching. I teach only two things: dukkha and the ending of dukkha. And that's and, and you know, it's easy to sort of look at the great compendium of the. Of the of the Buddha's teachings um, and the <coughs> commentaries and the Abhidhamma and you know there's lots to know and lots to <coughs> lots of explanations for everything, but the heart of it, the purpose of it, is that is that is that recognition of experience. And that, as human beings, um, uh, everybody wants to be happy, peaceful, at ease, comfortable, safe, free from dukkha, and and uh, and the tools that the Buddha gives are for that purpose, and so that something like let's say. A Bayagiri or any any proper monastery, any good monastery, any good say meditation center, any good um, collective of human beings get, coming together um, um, are uh, the purpose uh, dukkha and ending it for knowing dukkha and knowing how to be free from dukkha. Which is corollary is also uh, n knowing happiness and knowing how to 
realize happiness. Knowing peace and knowing how to realize peace. Yeah, that's, it's, that's its core. But the Buddha used dukkha as a, as a, because nobody wants to experience dukkha. Nobody gets up in the morning and, you know, as you're brushing your teeth and washing your face, you're sort of thinking, you know, how can I get more dukkha in my life today? And it's, <laughs> it's nobody, nobody thinks that. But it's, it's the, uh, um, but we do do it. <laughs> That's how we live. <laughs> where, uh, we go on to autopilot and we just uh, stumble our way through our life. <laughs> Uh, but that's the whole purpose of a practice and a way of practice is to be able to to you know, to realize a sense of you know, understanding dukkha and understanding the freedom from from dukkha, <coughs> and that's something that that Ajahn Chah uh, over and over again. I mean, I lived with Ajahn Chah for so many years, and and uh, uh, and he gave many 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 teachings, but. He'd always come back to, to that that point because th that's the rub, that's the exper that's the experiential basis for exploring, investigating, practicing, so, and you have to bring it back to experience. It can't be can't be about theory, ideals, speculation. It has to be about experience so that. You know, 25 years of Abhayagiri and the support and encouragement from all of our teachers and elders over all this time, the support and encouragement from the for all the lay community from, well, I mean, just like today, Zoom, uh, Zoom, <coughs> uh, a Zoom gathering, and 17 countries are, are involved. I mean, it's it's a uh, uh, it's wonderful, uh, and you know everybody is wishing us well. I mean, people don't you know, again. So, you know, people don't make the effort to 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 sign up to the Zoom and and plug in sort of you know, say for. Look, looking for failure and finding fault. It's there. Everybody's wishing, wishing us well, and everybody's wishing each other well. And it's important to make it conscious. These are the sort of things we overlook or forget. And, and so that to uh, uh, having occasions like this are a great opportunity for bringing it to mind and then uh, dedicating our practice for the for our own benefit and the benefit of others. That's something that, it's a refrain that comes up over and over again through the Buddhist teachings that, that uh, say one practices for say one's own welfare and happiness and for the welfare and happiness of others. It's that is a, that's your, your, your thread that underlies uh, uh, our practice. So today we're, it's the first day of, of gathering and I just delight in the fact that so many people uh, are joining us, <coughs> yeah, both physically and virtu virtually, and uh, it's an opportunity to practice together and to listen to teachings together, reflect on teachings together, uh, and to dedicate the blessings for everyone, so, more time.